Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, thank you for joining our webinar on playground safety. I, I understand that this is a, a very busy time of the year, so uh, we truly appreciate that you have uh, decided to invest an hour of your time with us to learn a little more about playground safety. Uh, we have some people that are still logging on, but it's uh, 12.02, so we'll go ahead and, and get started. And uh, I should start, I guess, by introducing myself. Um, my name is Andy Jimenez. I'm the Senior VP of uh, Risk and Trust Operations here at Aegis, and today I'll also be your host. We did open up this webinar to both um, FIA members as well as non-members, so if you allow me, I just want to take uh, 30 seconds to introduce our firm to those that are joining us that might not be familiar with uh, Aegis or FIA. Um, but Aegis was founded in 2018, I'm sorry, 2008, apologize for that. And since 2012, we have been the uh, trust administrators of the Florida Insurance Alliance, uh, better known as FIA. And FIA is a governmental self-insurance trust that provides property and casualty insurance, as well as other risk management services like loss control to over 800 local governmental entities um, and schools in our state. Our membership is very diverse, but we specialize in public charter schools and special districts. Today's webinar, as you know, is on playground safety. And we typically do these trainings in person, uh, at schools, at, at districts, at conferences. Uh, we work with just about any public entity that owns or is responsible for the maintenance of playgrounds, parks, recreational areas. Um, but this year, in addition of doing these trainings in person, we're also doing a series of webinars uh, on many different topics. And while we do prefer to do them in person, we've actually received great feedback from our members, and some of them actually prefer this format, particularly those that are still working from home. Um, so let's uh, meet the team. Brian Rutnerain and Eileen Caradine, many of you have had the pleasure of working with them. Um, I see if you, there, have you popped up on the screen yet? Ryan, are we you are here? Perfect. Um, Ryan is the manager of loss control services. Um, he's been with Aegis for three years. And a quick fun fact about Ryan is that both Ryan and I worked at the same carrier at the same time in different departments. Um, but we were both at, at Liberty Mutual um, for a few years. Then he went over to the Hartford where he was a risk engineer and consultant before we uh, snatched him up here at Aegis. And Eileen has been with us for over a year, doing an amazing job working with our districts and schools in South Florida. Uh, she doesn't share this very often, but she was the national director uh -huh. of uh, risk control for one of the largest retailers in the country. Uh, she worked there for 25 years and basically built their risk management department from, from scratch. Uh, she also worked as a loss control consultant in the public sector before moving to Florida, where she found her forever home here at Aegis. So um, we're very proud of the loss control uh, expertise that we have here in-house. Both Ryan and Eileen are certified playground safety inspectors. Uh, I am not. So um, Ryan and Eileen, if you can uh, take it from here. Absolutely. There's Ryan and I uh, in action, masks and all, um, actually just last week. So. That was a fun week. So I'm going to start us off here and go through the agenda. But before I do that, I'm actually going to go ahead and we're going to go off camera. Um, so you guys can concentrate on looking at the slides. You may happen to notice yourself in some of these pictures, maybe not yourself, but particularly your school or your district. If so, if it's a great picture, we want to thank you for the opportunity of, of uh, sharing that and using as a good example. If maybe it's an opportunity, we also want to thank you because this is exactly what this webinar is about. It's about learning from what we've seen out there and leveraging that and sharing it so we can do better going forward. So again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we don't have to tell you all about the many benefits that playgrounds offer our kids, especially because you all are the ones on the playgrounds every day, perhaps responsible for watching the kids there or in fact for the maintenance of them. So you see firsthand how fun they can be. Um, I will say as the mother of two now grown kids, 
the greatest benefit I saw from playgrounds was the long nap that would happen after I took my kids there so I could get a little bit of peace. But you joined us today because you know that playgrounds, as beneficial as they can be, they are also work. So we're going to cover a bunch of things today, but really what we want to focus on is how to keep our playgrounds in peak condition and prevent injuries. Why? Because it not only protects the kids, but it also protects the school or the district that you support. So we're going to cover some of the basics today. What can happen? Why it usually happens? Then we'll get into what can be done to mitigate your exposure and prevent injuries. We will dive a little bit deeper into surfacing, um, maintenance, inspection, kind of those key things that will limit your liability. And lastly, we're going to let you know what your resources are going forward so that you know we can put what you learned today into play. So let's go ahead and get started here. All right. So unfortunately, playgrounds are where accidents happen. Um, they are, well, they're designed to support, the, you know, the physical and social and intellectual development of our kids. Frankly, no matter what we do, we're going to see accidents on the playground. So being that we insure close to 200 charter schools in the state of Florida and over 600 districts, some with some really elaborate playgrounds. Ryan and I hear some crazy stories and we kind of have seen our fair share of injuries and some of those leading in fact to claims. So many of those stories involve the playgrounds. I think um, Ryan would probably agree with me that there's not much that surprises us anymore. I'm not sure that's from our time in Egypt and, and on playgrounds, but just in general, <laughs> that's the nature of, uh, of being in loss control. So let's take a, a closer look at what these injuries look like. Okay, this slide, as you can, you can tell, it displays the most common injuries on the playground. What are the things that are happening? You'll notice that the highest percentage is obviously the fractures, 36%, okay? Biggest piece of the pie there. They're followed closely by your bruises, abrasions, 21%, and then, of course, lacerations and strains follow, follow in there. No real surprises there, I think, for, for any of us. But what was interesting to me and what, what I want you to take note of is that even though there are small percentages for concussions and those internal and organ damage, okay, we're, we're going to explain why those happen. And while they may not happen as frequently, those are the ones that really deserve our attention because those are the ones that when they do happen, they typically or often result in a lawsuit. So we want to make sure that we are definitely taking the necessary steps to avoid them. Okay. So now that we know what the injuries are, where on the playground are they happening? Where exactly are they are they happening? The injury hotspot, so to speak. So I don't think it's any real surprise to any of us that the monkey bars, the swings, the slides are going to top the list. Um, they were always some of my favorites, not sure how you feel about them, but those of you that are with us from the charter schools, you can attest to this, I'm, I'm sure, right? Those, that's where your eyes are drawn mostly, that's where the kids congregate. What I think is interesting is you total up all the injuries that are associated with each of these pieces of equipment here, okay? If we're really looking closely at the number, that's nearly 1.8 million a year, like, to me, that's just, that's staggering. And with as crazy as 2020 has been, I can only imagine what that number is this year. Well, actually, it's probably less this year because we're there. We have, we have some time where they can't get on the playground, but it's just, it, that number is huge. And so I can't help but ask you, who has taken the time to get on this webinar, what part of that, that nearly 1.8 million injuries do you personally want to be responsible for? And I think we all know that the, the answer to that question is zero. So if we want that to happen, we need to understand what those risks are and how to prevent them. And that's really why we think it's, it's critical for people to have the information that we're about to share with you. So 
now that we have a bird's eye view of those injuries, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into why they happen and where are the disconnects? What can be done? Okay. I think our first thought on these injuries is like, all right, well, I can tell you why they happen. Kids do crazy things and where are the parents and why aren't they watching them? But I think it's important to remember that the playgrounds are designed to push the kids and they're designed to encourage them to take risks. So we have to weigh those two things um, together. Um, and as you know, risk makes us loss control folks a bit uneasy. So hopefully um, we can we can work together to eliminate those. So I don't think that we can prevent every single injury from happening, but I think there's a lot we can do to mitigate the circumstances that lead to them. So Ryan's going to elaborate on the things that we can control, and he's gonna dive into some of the common causes of injuries. So hopefully if we understand those, we can begin to put the safeguards in place. So Ryan? Thanks, Eileen. Uh, well, it would be hard for us to have a discussion on keeping children safe without mentioning supervision. Uh, we can design a playground that's the safest in the world, but it just can't replace the safety and security uh, of having a responsible adult supervise. As we all know, children tend to be more active in outdoor learning play areas than so they tend to be inside. Uh, and for this reason, they need to be watched even more carefully. Um, I know we've all been guilty of being distracted at one time or another. I know I, I tend to look at my phone every time I hear a noise, trying to, to work on that as we all are. Uh, but the consequences of this when supervising children on the playground could be quite a bit more severe. Supervision is also helpful in ensuring that children are playing on equipment that's designed for their abilities. Um, as you can imagine, if you have a three-year-old versus a six-year-old, there could be a gap in the coordination skills and motor skills that could make a more robust piece of play equipment a bit of a challenge for a three-year-old. So um, when these manufacturers design playgrounds, they typically focus on two age groups. Those age groups are the two to five-year-olds um, and then the school-age children, which is the five to 12-year-olds. So a lot of times when playgrounds are installed, you'll have a separate structure for the toddlers and a separate structure for the school age children. There are times where those two structures are blended into one, and those are the, the times where supervision is even more important. It's also important to um, have an unobstructed view of all areas of the playground. When we're on site visits, we're typically making note of where benches are, where tables are, um, and, and where landscaping is. We don't want a hedge or a tree blocking the view. Um, so as you take a look at your playground, some of the questions you can ask yourself is, you know, can the children be seen at all times? Uh, and are there any obstructions, trees or branches in the way? Uh, and then lastly, is, they, is there a clear path to where you can run to a child um, and react quickly if the need arises? Um, so we mentioned age appropriateness here on the previous slide, and one of the best ways to convey that to people is via signage. Um, signage plays a number of important roles. It makes sure that everyone knows about the potential dangers that may be associated with playground use, as well as some of those rules and best practices uh, to keep in mind to help prevent injuries. Um, it also provides a means to re reinforce the importance of adult supervision. Uh, it also provides a reminder of hot surfaces. I know we, we all live in Florida and have been out there in the sun. And, and some of those uh, hazards that we may not normally think about, like entanglement hazards. Uh, you could alternatively have labels on the playground to uh, convey the age ranges and the warnings. But uh, as, you, as you can imagine, signage is typically more visible. Uh, that being said, certainly wouldn't hurt to have both signage and labels just as a backup. So um, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on uh, playground falls, and the reason for that is it's the most common mechanism of injury. Uh, in fact, falls from equipment actually accounts for over two-thirds of all playground injuries. Um, and this is to be expected. As Eileen said earlier, playgrounds are designed to challenge children. 
However, just because a child falls doesn't mean that they have to be injured. When they fall and they do get injured, it's typically due to either improper surfacing or inadequate safety surfacing. Uh, although you may see safety surfacing below uh, a piece of playground equipment, it's important to ensure that it's of the appropriate type and that it's adequately maintained. Um, I read one study where it cited that 80% of kids that were severely injured in falls landed on what was perceived to be a so-called safe surface because just just because it's there doesn't mean that it's appropriate necessarily. So something that you'll hear us discuss over and over during this presentation and when we're on site visits with you guys is the important of, importance of a properly installed shock absorbing surface. Uh, and, and the reason for this is because the chances of being injured on a safe surface versus a non-safe surface, and we'll go over what those are, is actually cut in half. So in the coming slides, we'll dive a little bit deeper into the role that safety surfacing plays and share some information with you so that you can uh, make a better decision when it comes to replacing surfacing or adding surfacing. So surfacing can be a very complicated topic, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. We do get a lot of questions, understandably so, um, like which is the best surfacing? Is there a particular surfacing that we recommend versus another? And of course, which costs the least? And, and all of these are important, but it's hard to provide an answer uh, without taking into consideration all of the unique elements of your playground and your community, as well as your budget. So some things you need to consider is what's the layout of your site? Um, and then how much time and money can you allocate to maintenance? Uh, but no matter which surfacing you end up choosing, it's going to have to comply with an ASTM standard. Uh, it's F1292. Uh, and when you go to purchase this material, you're going to be looking for that. Um, and, and we'll dive a little bit deeper here on the next slide. And we're, we're going to be discussing the two main types of surfacing materials, which is unitary surfacing and then loose fill surfacing. So loose fill surfacing, uh, we'll talk about first, mainly because it's the most common surfacing that we see. Actually, over 50,000 playgrounds within the US is using some sort of loose fill surfacing as their safety material. Um, it comes in a few different forms. It can include pea gravel, sand, rubber, uh, engineered wood fiber, which, you know, normal non-playground people just call wood mulch. Um, we definitely see the wood mulch more often. However, the rubber mulch is becoming a little bit more popular um, as it provides a little bit more flexibility, but without the higher price tag of like a poured in place uh, surface. Um, with the rubber mulch, though, there have been concerns about um, toxins uh, and other chemicals because they're typically made of recycled tires. It's a legitimate concern. There have been quite a few studies on it. Uh, the Consumer Product Safety Commission actually released a report on it. Super detailed. It's 358 pages. I won't share all that with you. I'm sure you don't want to read it. But suffice it to say, uh, if you do decide to go with a rubber mulch, just check to see that the standards are, are uh, followed. You can check out the company's website to see if they're even aware of those standards. So there are ways to, to have rubber mulch that, that is safe. Um, so now on to some of the benefits of loose fill surfacing. They are generally affordable, um, pretty easy to install. They can offer good drainage um, and, and usually pretty exceptional protection for falls. Um, and if eco-friendliness is a concern, they can blend into natural surroundings uh, pretty well. It's also important to note that the playground mulch, particularly the wood mulch, is different from landscaping mulch. Um, you couldn't go to uh, your local Home Depot and pick up a bag of landscaping mulch. Playground mulch is ground a little bit more finely, it's, and it's designed specifically for use with children and to provide impact absorption. Um, some of the cons are the disadvantages to loose fill surfacing. Uh, it requires more maintenance. Uh, as I'm sure you guys have seen, the mulch uh, often gets kicked away from those high use areas like underneath swings and uh, outside of slide exits. So as a result, it needs to be raked and replenished pretty often to ensure that that uh, impact absorption is still there. 
And these are some of the considerations that you need to take into account because that might increase both uh, maintenance cost and time. One of the ways that you can kind of reduce the uh, amount of maintenance needed is by installing wear mats. Uh, if you look at that large photo with the uh, two blue and yellow swings there, there's some rubber mats that are beneath there. And those are key in, in kind of reducing the need to rake uh, the mulch back in place uh, on, the, on those high use areas. Another consideration with um, mulch and loose fill surfacing is you're gonna need a retaining barrier. You're gonna need some sort of a border around the playground area to make sure that the mulch doesn't either float away in a rainstorm or, or, or get blown out of place otherwise. Um, and I mentioned good drainage as one of the pros. It's also important to note that the good drainage only occurs if the site has been prepared properly. So it can't be a low-lying area. You've got to make sure that there's adequate drainage in place. Um, otherwise, you could end up with, with flooding, which we'll take a look at uh, here in a bit. Lastly, loose fill surfacing, uh, whether it be wood mulch, rubber mulch, tends to be good at hiding foreign objects um, like glass or other sharp objects. So it's important uh, when you're out there to be looking for those kind of things. As I mentioned, loose fill is the most popular, so we've included a couple extra photos here uh, just to share with you some examples. All the way on the left-hand side, uh, that picture with the blue post, um, they actually just threw rubber mulch on top of an existing sand surface. Um, and I think the idea was good, but again, it's important that the surfacing is proper, properly prepped. So if you're deciding to go from sand to rubber or from wood to rubber, you need to take all of the old surfacing out and, and make sure that there's no mixing occurring because that can compromise the functionality of, of the surfacing. Um, second picture there with the chains, uh, the anchoring of equipment, uh, like this climber here, needs to be fully covered by the mulch. So if you see something like this where the anchoring is visible, it, it's a sure sign that you, you either need more mulch or that the installer did something incorrect. Uh, the middle picture, um, shows a playground that's using sand surfacing. Uh, the fall height isn't too high, uh, so the sand may be appropriate, but over time there's been a lot of other organic materials, I think pine leaves and things like the pine straw that's got mixed in there. So with the sand, it's important that it's sifted out and, and cleaned regularly. Picture all the way on the right-hand side, uh, what we wanted to highlight here is the fact that a lot of the play equipment actually includes a label or a sticker with a line on it to, to show you um, if your surfacing is of adequate depth. The other primary type of surfacing is unitary surfacing. Um, it's basically elements, typically rubber, that's bounded together. It could be in a tile format or a rolled product. It could be artificial turf. A couple of other names that you may be familiar with is uh, rubber tiles and poured in place rubber. Um, again, these could be made of recycled tires. So if you have any of those rubber concerns, um, it's something to consider here as well. Unitary surfacing has a lot of pros. Um, it doesn't typically require a lot of maintenance. You don't have to rake things back in place. It's, it's solid. Um, so for those of you who may have a larger budget, on the onset and less time for maintenance, uh, it might be a good fit. They're typically more slip resistant uh, than loose fill surfaces, uh, and they typically have longer warranties, uh, except when you're placing them in those high use areas. They're also available in a wide array of colors, so if you want to match your school or community colors, you can easily do so. Some of the cons are the downsides. We mentioned before the initial acquisition and installation costs can be pretty expensive uh, because you do need to hire a professional. Um, also, during the summer, they can get pretty hot. I've also seen uh, that kids, I've heard that kids like to throw this at other kids more so than wood mulch for some reason, so that's something to consider. Um, and when you purchase this, it's always important to ensure that it meets those ASTM F1292 standards, uh, and then you get the actual certification papers with it. 
Um, the last consideration, and this is unique to unitary surfaces, is that you can't really see what's happening beneath that top layer like you could with loose fill surfacing. Uh, the surfacing can appear intact, but it's possible that beneath it's started to harden or decay and may not perform as it should. So if you've had poured in place surfacing or unitary surfacing for a couple of years, it might be a good idea to have a professional come out um, and conduct the test to ensure that it's still performing as it was intended to. With, uh, with loose fill surfacing, uh, it's important to ensure that it's of the required depth. This is something that we always look at when we're doing site visits and we're always talking about. So to better understand why this is so important, uh, it's important to understand the concept of fall height. So fall height is basically the highest place on a playground that a child can fall from, the, whatever the highest platform is. Um, and it's the distance between that highest platform and the protective surfacing. So if we look at this table here, you can see that the different types of loose fill material uh, provides different levels of protection from different fall heights, right? So for example, one of the reasons why we're not seeing sand and pea gravel as much is that nine inches of each of these only provides protection for falls from four or five feet, right? Whereas something like shredded rubber or wood chips, nine inches can give you fall protection for falls from up to, to uh, 10 feet. So it never hurts that, you know, when you're out there to maybe take a ruler with you just to uh, measure it to see if that mulch or whatever surfacing has not compacted to below that nine inch mark. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind that if you're having new mulch or new loose fill surfacing added that they actually put it in at the 12 inch mark because it does compact over time. Um, a lot of these playground borders that you see if you look at that picture on the right hand side, a lot of people don't notice this, but there actually is a measuring tool built in there. So it provides a quick and easy way when you're out there, just take a look at it. Um, you know, this one here is at seven inches, for example. That's not terrible, but it's probably due uh, to be topped off by, by a couple more inches. Again, maintenance of these surfaces is critical, um, especially in those high use areas. Uh, if these areas are not maintained, you can end up with divots and holes. Um, we take a look at this blue poured in place surfacing you can see that it's worn out over time and we've got some divots those can definitely be um, trip hazards the middle picture the surfacing has deteriorated or washed away and we can even see the uh, the underlayment or the weed block underneath it which is a trip hazard in itself you could also see the concrete footers that hold that uh, one piece of equipment in which could be one, a hard surface if someone were to fall, but also a, uh, a trip hazard. Um, in the top photo there, uh, not only has the mulch deteriorated and washed away, but this particular playground seems to have a drainage issue. So not only is this a soft, muddy surface where kids can trip and fall, but when the mulch gets compacted like that with water, it's actually not going to provide the same amount of uh, shock absorption that it was intended to. So again, just to reinforce it with, with surfacing, if it's loose fill or poured in place, uh, that maintenance is, is critical. Another concept that's important to understand with regard to, to playground safety is use zones. So, a use zone is, is pretty much the area around a piece of, of play equipment. So it's important that this area, one, includes the safety surfacing that we've been talking about, but also that there are not any other obstructions in the area like furniture or even another piece of equipment. It could also be a piece of landscaping like a tree. Um, so with regard to surfacing, you know, if we take a look at this example of the rope climber leftmost picture, um, you know, if, if a child climbs all the way to the top of that rope and lets go or falls for some reason, uh, it's likely that they might fall back past the mulch and the timber there onto the sidewalk. So 
for certain types of equipment, it's important to remember that, um, you know, you might need six feet or more of, of free space with, with surfacing. Um, the middle picture, there's a spring rocker there, but then there's a picnic table or a bench right next to it. So as you can imagine, kids are rocking back and forth on that. They lose their balance and fall backwards. It's likely that they might hit the back of their head on, on that table instead of the surfacing, which uh, can be a problem. Um, third picture there on the right, uh, kind of hard to tell, but that is a slide exit. And uh, on the left side of it is actually another bench. So you could totally see, and this is one of those spinner slides too, a child coming down there, uh, maybe a little bit too fast, a little bit too excited, and just slamming into, into that bench. So uh, it's, it's important to, you know, again, make sure that there's safety surfacing there and that there's no obstructions. Um, so required distancing, I know distancing has been a popular term for 2020, um, except we're not talking about social distancing here. Required distancing with playground equipment is important for a couple of reasons. So one, we want to make sure that if we take this swing, for instance, that there's not a bench or another piece of equipment that while a child is swinging, they can, they can, they can uh, bump into. So if we take the swing example, um, can do some really basic math here. Let's say that the height of the top of the swing set and the ground is 10 feet. Basically what that means is that you would need two times that or 20 feet free and clear in front of the slot of the swing set uh, and another 20 feet behind the swing set. So you can imagine if these benches, for instance, were closer together and maybe closer to the swing set, when kids are swinging, they could hit the bench and become injured or hit the person that's on the bench as well. A couple other ones, um, six feet between swing sets. And then if you have a composite play structure, which is what's shown all the way on the left-hand side, um, this is basically a play structure that has slides and other equipment. You're gonna need uh, about nine feet of clearance. So this isn't something that you necessarily have to memorize. It's just important that you know, if you decide to add some benches, picnic tables, or maybe another piece of equipment that you ensure that you actually have the required distancing and spacing in place. Trips and falls are another common hazard on the playground. Um, they can be caused by a wide variety of items, including the play components themselves. Um, this can include parts of the equipment that maybe stick out too far into the flow of traffic, uh, exposed concrete footers that we saw before, uh, rocks, or just any abrupt change in, in elevation. Um, if we take a look at these examples, we mentioned uh, in, in, the, in the big picture in the middle that drainage is important, but if the drain is above the safety surfacing, we can definitely have a trip hazard. I know to us it might be open and obvious, but to a child running around, uh, they may not notice it. Bottom left photo, an irrigation line. Um, if you have to run these across a playground for some reason, it's really important to ensure that it's way below the surfacing and not above it. Um, lastly, tree roots. Uh, as a lot of these oak trees and various other trees start to mature over time, the roots start to pop up. That combined with um, diminished or displaced safety surfacing uh, kind of creates a perfect storm as far as trip hazards go. So make sure you add surfacing to cover those roots. And if you need to call in somebody to maybe grind those roots down, um, you know, go ahead and do so as, as well. All right. Well, that's a lot of information about falls. Um, a lot of, lot of good information there, Ryan. Thank you. And um, keep in mind that I know some of that was, was technical. If you guys have questions, obviously Ryan and I are, are here to answer those following too. So if you need us to reiterate some of those things. Um, I think by now we, we all have a good understanding of what can go wrong and, and why we need to pay better attention um, to not only reduce the frequency of injuries through better supervision, but also the severity of the injuries through choosing and maintaining good surfacing. So we're gonna move on to a couple of other 
random hazards. Um, this picture, of course, is an exaggeration, but if the play equipment is too hot, it might as well be true. Um, we all know how strong the Florida sun is, and I know Ryan talked touched on the, the hot surfaces when it came to the signage, but this is where, you know, reality sets in. And those metal slides, if, if there, there are still some out there, even the plastic ones can become dangerously hot. So we encourage teachers and the parents through the signage to check that play equipment before the kids get on it to play to make sure it's not too hot. Um, this obviously is why many of you invest in the nice shade structures as well. Um, I was reading an article about an 18 month old girl who, yes, this is the kind of reading that we do, <laughs> um, who suffered second degree burns to her hands, her knees and her stomach from going down the hot slide in, of all places, Des Moines, Iowa. Okay, not where I think of that it's that it's going to be really hot, but the pictures were, I mean, they brought tears to my eyes. But the thing that I thought that was interesting is that the slide surface temperature was measured at 163 degrees on an 80 degree day. So you can just, you know, escalate that when we're talking about the Florida sun and um, and and there's there's your hot surface injury. So I next slide talks about the surrounding area to the playground. And I know we've been in talking about surfacing, we're encouraging you to look down and look at the ground and see what's around you. But now I'm asking you to actually pick your eyes up and look around. Um, rather than that tunnel vision of, of what's actually on the playground, look beyond that and look what is in the surrounding area. In this picture in the top left, you can picture a kid wandering from that playground, going over to that bench, down, you know, having that, that pond be curious there and then wandering over there. Maybe that's not a pond, maybe it's a pool, maybe it's the woods, maybe it's a parking lot. So I think, you can use your imagination to finish each of those scenarios. And it, it brings to, to light, if you guys have heard the term attractive nuisance. So where a person creates or permits to exist a dangerous condition that's attractive to kids. So it be an unfenced swimming pool, okay? Um, there, is, there is liability there. So we wanna make sure that we are, you know, if, if in your district or at the, the school if there's areas that we don't want the children to access that we put some sort of access control in there i know we see gates in some of these playgrounds especially the ones that are adjacent to pools um, but just helping to keep the kids in or from wandering out is is another thing to keep in mind um, next slide protrusions and entanglements these are kind of two big, scary sounding words. Um, and I'll try and tell the story with these pictures instead. Um, basically, we are looking for things that stick up off the surfacing of the, of the play equipment um, and that stick out because they can present two types of hazards. They can be ones where they become more of an impalement hazard so it's, it's sharp, it can go through someone's eye, it can go into their belly, it can cut them pretty severely. When those things like this bolt in the top left picture are up over the surface, then it also becomes a place where things can get entangled in there, be that a drawstring, a dog leash if people have their dogs at the, at the playground as well, a jump rope, any type of you know uh, rope or clothing can get caught on that. And then we, then of course that leads to an entanglement um, hazard and possibly even a, a strangulation. So those things, those minor things may seem really small, but they can lead to much, much larger issues. When we talk about the S hooks, um, if you look at the slide picture that is on the far left and you see the connector that's connecting the seat of the swing to the chain, that is in fact an S. Those should always be closed. 
and close, you know, how closed is closed, that gap that should be no larger than the size of a dime. So if you're wondering, hey, is this closed enough that something can't get caught in it? If it's larger than the, than the width of a dime, yeah, chances are stuff can get caught in there. Same thing goes for the slide. That's, that center picture is actually a gap in the slide in the, you know, a, a, a round slide. So the gaps, you know, when that slide starts loosening up, that gap starts getting bigger and fingers can get caught in there, their drawstrings can get caught in there and uh, the child gets caught. So we wanna make sure that, that that stuff is tightened down and is closed up. A good um, measurement for the threads and, and the bolts you'll see in that far picture on the right is that there should be no more than two threads beyond the nut showing. That means it's sticking out too far. There's too much there for stuff to get caught on. Not to mention that's actually missing the bolt itself. So have, is, that, is that piece of equipment structurally sound? We'll, we would definitely question that. Um, it is of important note that to let you know that the Consumer Product Safety Commission issued a warning too about the danger of entrapment and entanglement when it comes to bike helmets. And specifically because a kid can kind of get their head in somewhere, but they, with the bike helmet on, they can't get it out. Uh, so we wanna make sure that that's why you see that warning of no bike helmets on the playground, as well as the straps from those, because as you know, many times it's hard for those kids to keep them, them strapped. And that becomes something that, that can, uh, can get entangled in something as well. Insects, um, bees, fire ants are probably the, the insects that, that Ryan and I see the most out there and that you guys probably struggle with. Um, nobody likes the bugs, um, including me. So unfortunately, they, they do like to find places in the playground. And a lot of times it's under those platforms. That's where that bees nest is there on the far right. Um, the fire ants, sometimes, you know, they might be in the mulch, but you also have to look at the pathway to the playground as well and the fields that the kids are running in. I'm sure some of you with us from, from the charter schools or that think that that's a constant challenge. And of course, you know, with pest control programs, um, you know, trying to get rid of these without the use of, of heavy chemicals for the children um, is, is a concern. We also find that in some of the pest control programs that are preventing the, um, maybe you're trying to get rid of the fire ants in the field, but then they just migrate to other areas of your, of your property, so, or your, your campus. So keep that in mind um, as, as well. Um, that picture on the far left, um, actually not so funny story is you see that, um, I guess it's the, the microphone, the, on the far left, yeah, um, we were actually, uh, I think Ryan and uh, Brent were on a site visit and uh, we're actually, <laughs> you know, just like we encourage you to be a kid and get on there and inspect your playground. They were about to uh, talk into that microphone and in fact, the bees found Brent and, uh, and flew out of there. So imagine if a child had actually put their face on there to use the piece of equipment and the bees would have flown right into the child's face. So again, something to definitely look for. So we call this appropriate equipment, but I, I think maybe a, a better title would be inappropriate equipment, but that just sounded kind of weird. So what we're getting at here is we would want you to make sure that you purchase your equipment from reputable sources, that the, the do-it-yourself projects don't usually work out too well, like hanging an old tire for, for kids to play on, um, bringing the, the kitchen that your children have outgrown for your, the, the uh, pairs to, to play on. Not only is it not graded for commercial use, it also, this kitchen in particular, it, presenting a, a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Um, I'm not really sure about the stairway to nowhere, but yes, we, we did see this on one of our visits. 
um, I think all these pictures demonstrate how creative we can be and how much we we just want to, you know, put some fun stuff out there for the kids to play on. But in fact, we need to make sure that it's tough, that it's it, it can handle the handle the uh, the rugged play and, and still take a beating. So the current standards will ensure that happens. Some misses that we that we see again in these little details, um, sharp edges on things. Uh, this is the the borders and the you know those things are going to have to be hammered back down. The missing caps on the ends of the metal bars. That's another common thing that we see. And again, that's just where the where the bees and and insects can can hang out when your mulch starts deteriorating and getting washed away and we're not uh, replenishing it you can see that even just the the transition from the sidewalk to the playground can get rather treacherous i think what it's important to comment on all of those pictures that you that you just saw leading up to this is that with a preventative maintenance program you can prevent a lot of injuries from happening in the first place. Because a, instituting a preventative maintenance program is going to allow you to address hazards when they're small. You're gonna be able to fix those, those little things and protect your investment. I think we all know just how expensive the equipment is and the investment that you're making. So I think that it's, it's critical that we just we institute that regular maintenance and regular, regular, regularly taking care of it so that we can extend the life of the equipment. It's just like our cars require periodic maintenance, so do the playgrounds. Um, I think that each of the issues that Ryan and I look for when we conduct a site visit, you know, if they were addressed with regular inspection and maintenance, we, we probably would not find them. So I think it's important and it's a, a we would highly recommend that you talk about what your preventative maintenance program looks like. Um, the preventative maintenance program demonstrates your duty of care. And that right there is your key in minimizing your liability. So if you don't have a maintenance process for your, for your playground and you're not you know, looking at them and identifying what do we need to do? Hey, monthly, we should probably, you know, go through and, and check this, you know, every six months we should add surfacing. If you're not doing that, you are opening up your school or your district to a negligent exposure. Inspections. Now that we kind of know what goes wrong, Ryan, if you could bring it home for everyone and uh, let them know about the single most important part of this webinar, according to us, and that is the need to inspect your playgrounds. Absolutely. Um, so we went over quite a bit in this presentation, but if you walk away with anything, uh, it should be the importance of regularly and documented inspections. Um, how often you do these inspections uh, is really going to vary based on how frequently your playground is used. Uh, but we typically recommend that the inspections are done on at least a monthly basis. Um, if you're going to be out there on a daily basis, it definitely doesn't hurt to do a quick visual inspection. Uh, you know, it'll help you identify any deficiencies or dangerous conditions before they become a real problem can kind of help you with your repair planning process as well. Um, Eileen touched on do care uh, and, and what having an inspection process in place does is it shows that you've, you've being, you're being reasonable as far as your, your duty of care and, and your actions are concerned. Um, you know, should a claim occur and should a claimant seek legal counsel, a lot of times these types of things are scrutinized. Um, and, and the inspections, you know, when you do find something that needs to be repaired, it's important to put a cone or a caution tape there to make sure that it's inaccessible. Um, and then, you know, when you're inspecting these playgrounds, you're not only looking for something to be broken, it could just be something that's, that's worn out. Um, and I think that the best part of the inspection process uh, is that they can be fun. Um, you can be 
a kid, you can be a little bit more enthusiastic than this lady in the blue and black there. Um, you know, you can get up and you can jump on the equipment. You can give everything a shake, see if it's secure. Um, it's a chance to kind of be a kid. And then, you know, it's also important to take a step back and look at things from a distance. Uh, you know, you can be looking for those use zones, those obstructions, signs of overuse. Um, and, and one thing that we've noticed, too, during our site visits is that um, there's not only issues with older equipment. Sometimes we'll see brand new equipment that was recently installed and there'll be, um, you know, a, a loose fastener that uh, is one, a protrusion hazard, and then also could just mean that that piece of the equipment would fall off. So it's important not to get too comfortable uh, with the new equipment. To help you out with your inspections, um, we have developed an internal playground safety checklist. Um, you will all get this after the webinar has concluded. Uh, it's a two page document. The first page of the document kind of provides a summary of a lot of the things we've talked about today. Um, and the second page is the actual checklist. It's one page, really easy to complete. It covers surfacing, drainage, general hazards, security, durability of the equipment, and then just general upkeep of the playground. And the great thing about it is it provides you with a means to actually document your, your issues and your inspection process. So it's based on things that Eileen and I have seen out in the field, uh, as well as some of those uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission best practices. Additional resources, um, one of the things you've heard us mention a couple of times now is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. They're actually the ones who developed the Public Playground Safety Handbook. I will tell you it is about 200 pages. It can get pretty technical, but it is a good resource. Um, there's also the National Recreation and Park Association, which is where Eileen and I got our uh, CPSI designations from. Uh, and, and then most importantly, there's us, there's Eileen and I, I mean, we could help you dissect this information, um, make it make sense, help you with some of your decision-making processes and implementing your preventative maintenance program. And also we'd be happy to meet with you at your site, at your school, at your district. We can do an inspection with you. And we'll also take a look at maybe some of the other risk management opportunities outside of the playground uh, that we might be able to help you out with. All right, thank you, Eileen, Ryan. It's uh, 12.54. Um, really appreciate uh, you guys going through, through all that information. We do have some questions, uh, some, sorry, some, some time for, for questions. Um, I saw a few of those questions came in um, during the webinar, but if you have any questions, uh, you can type them into the Q&A and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. As Ryan mentioned, we will be, um, uh, not just uh, sharing the presentation as well as the safety checklist. We are also going to um, send you a link um, with a with a recorded version of this webinar. We're recording the webinar, and you can share that uh, with whoever was not able to attend or anyone that you think might benefit from from the information that we have shared. So let's see um, what questions came in. This is a good one. What changes in playground best practices have you seen or recommend during the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, Ryan, you want to take this one? Yeah, definitely a good one. So we, we get this question a lot, as you guys can imagine. Um, really, with regard to COVID-19, it's important to ensure that you have some process in place uh, to continue to sanitize the equipment. Um, there is only so much you can do when it, when it comes to sanitization. So uh, for that reason, it's important to remind uh, residents uh, and guests and, and students that self-sanitization is important. Uh, sanitize per CDC guidelines before and after using the playground. Um, I know sometimes, especially with children, you could kind of forget the uh, social distancing best practices. So having some signage in place there uh, to help remind uh, parents and kids is, is also a good idea. Certainly wouldn't have hurt to include use at your own risk language as well in the sign perfect. Okay, the uh, next question is, uh, our county comes out and inspects our playground once a year. Does this count as a regular inspection like you mentioned? 
Uh, and I think she's referring to the some of the counties, in, particularly in South Florida, to come out and inspect the, the playgrounds at, at schools. Um, Eileen, you're familiar with these inspections. You, you want to take this one? Eileen, we can't hear you. There we go. I would think that a year seems like a long time between inspections. So I think when Ryan was talking about regular, we were thinking about more of a, a monthly um, documented would, would be ideal there. But also with that, those inspections are gonna vary from county to county. So again, better aim on the safe side and inspect more regularly. Okay, perfect. Um, what playground hazard or issue leads to the most claims? <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yeah. It is. Um, you know, we've talked so much about falls and, and about surfacing during this presentation and for good reason. Um, like we said, kids are going to fall, you know, especially off of those monkey bars and things like that. Um, so ensuring that when they fall, there's enough protective surfacing to actually prevent them from getting injured is super critical. Um, if any of you have met us out in the field, we're all, always taking a look at the surfacing. We'll bust out the ruler and make sure it's of, of adequate depth. Um, also, the surfacing helps to cover up a lot of those trip hazards. So, uh, you know, besides the inspections, if you take away anything, it's, it's adequate surfacing. Yeah. And I would just add on, on the claim side, you know, with um, just about every uh, playground related claim that we have received, um, in the demand package where the attorney makes a, you know, sends a demand in or they file a lawsuit, there's always a picture that the plaintiff takes at the playground with, with the ruler showing that there was not enough, uh, you know, mulch or, or rubber on, on, in the playground structure. So always keep that in mind. Um, let's see if we have time for one or two more. Is there something in particular that playground signage has to say to prevent us from being sued? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take this one if you don't mind. So the, the answer is that if somebody wants to sue you, they're, they're going to sue you. They're going to sue the school or, or the district, and the sign is not going to stop them. Um, the presence of the sign is going to help us defend the claim. It can show that the district or school posted clear playground rules, age limits, and warned the, the parents of any potential risks that uh, that, that playground may, may have. Um, but to be honest on, on, this, on the schools, uh, the signage issue is really not that much of an issue because who, act, who has custody of, of the kids and who is in charge of the kids? Um, and it's, it's the teachers, it's the staff. So what we see more on the school claims is, is allegations of negligent supervision, right? The schools have a legal duty to provide uh, adequate supervision. So even if the playground is in perfect condition, um, a plaintiff could potentially have a successful or legitimate claim against the school if the school failed to uh, you know, properly supervise the, the kids. And we have several of, of, those, of those claims. So signage is extremely important, particularly for districts. Um, you have a duty to warn parents uh, about potential risks. Um, and in the case of the district, obviously it's the parent that is, that is uh, supervising the, the children um, and also to have clear, clear rules. But going back to the schools, the most important part is gonna be the supervision. And that's what's going to allow us to, to, to defend the claim against the school. Um, in, in recent years, you know, what we're seeing is that schools now have cameras everywhere. And many times they have cameras at, in, in the playgrounds. So um, when a plaintiff attorney um, alleges that there was no supervision, many times we're able to go to the tape, show the video of how many teachers were present, and also we'll time how long it took a teacher to reach the child once, once they fail. And in many times it could be seconds. Yeah, it could be it could be very quickly. Um, on the flip side, it also sometimes it does show the opposite. It does show that the kids uh, there were too many kids. They weren't supervised. Um, that they were um, you know jumping off a, a very uh, you know, tall surface uh, several different times, and, and no one was around to uh, to stop them. So uh, it's important in supervision uh, and signage goes hand in hand. Um, but if somebody wants to sue you. Um, 
you um, you better have some good insurance and that's where we come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, we see we have time for one more. Um, are there any other documents that we need to keep in our records outside of our inspection records? Um, Eileen, you want to take this one? Yeah, I think um, keep in mind your, you know, the more documentation, the better, but your installation, your anything that's dealing with your manufacturers, any information on the equipment, your obviously your inspection records go in there. Um, it could be your receipt from your mulch from your surfacing delivery. Uh, any of those details, including your maintenance records, put all in, keep them all in a in a file and keep them all together. Okay, perfect. All right, it is 1.02, um, so we'll wrap it up now. Uh, I want to thank everyone for spending this hour with us. Um, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out to us thank if you have you. any questions. If you have any, any feedback, any suggested topics for future webinars, please uh, email them to us. Um, if you join the webinar today, as we mentioned, you'll be receiving an email um, where you can watch uh, a recording of this webinar. We will also be attaching um, a copy of the playground uh, safety uh, checklist, as well as a copy of this presentation, if you guys um, will find that useful as well. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Eileen, Ryan, great okay. job. All right, take care. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Have a great day.